So right now we've got a video that was shot on location at Anarchapoco 2019 with John Snyson of Rural Alternative Media. Unfortunately, I messed up and the audio, uh, so you do see a microphone in there, but I had the setting on recording from the camera and not recording from the actual microphone. So the entire time we're going back and forth with the microphone, basically that was useless. So the audio is not uh, that great, which is really a shame because John is such a great mind, but I'm sure we'll hear a lot more from him as we work with him in the future. But there's a lot of great information about all these different, uh, uh, basically high level financial institutions and how they work with each other, basically to, to screw us, whether it's, you know, the exchange stabilization fund or all these other sort of things that we get into in the episode. But I do want to apologize for the audio quality. It's not how we normally like to roll with things, but you know, it's, you know, one of the first times I've shot on location. So uh, please pardon the uh, audio and you guys can also watch the video at BitChute. If you go to bitshoot.com forward slash the Liberty Advisor. Well, everyone, we are recording live on location from Anarchapoco 2019. I've been here for a few days, so I actually had to think about what year it was and don't even know what day it is. But we are here right now with Josh Sneeson of... John. John. Sorry, John. Josh is your partner. Josh Sigerson of World Alternative Media. This is his partner, John. And uh, it's been a great time so far. It was a little rough for John to get here today. It took, or get here a few days ago. It took uh, how many hours? Uh, only like 46 hours. That's fine. You know, survive. And a lot of great people along the, the way. I mean, you think it's like a government airlines or something. But one thing that John is really known for is his economic analysis. And it's actually been really crazy uh, as of late. We've seen, uh, you know, the market has just been going up week after week. It's been about, what, like six to six or seven weeks straight. It's been rocketing higher when really the fundamentals have not gotten any better. And actually, uh, there was a Zero Hedge article today, and I believe it was the uh, earnings expectations absolutely collapsing. And then at the same time, you have the S it shows the S&P 500 just going absolutely up. So, I mean, what do you kind of make of everything that's going on right now? Uh, should investors think that, you know, everything is over and that it's, you know, great days ahead? Or what really should people be thinking out there? Well, that's the thing. Like, if you are a long-term investor, you you're a fundamental investor. I I have a load of my gold and silver and crypto. That's that's what I have for the long term. And then for the short term, I don't really like being in the stock market or anything like that. So I'm not an expert on the you know the, the puts and offs and all that kind of stuff. I, I uh, try to stay out of you know volatility. I like solid things. I like things that you know I, I know have like some form of value to anybody. And that's that's why I put my money. But when you go and look at the markets today, you're looking at uh, the big companies, the big corporations, there's uh, share buybacks, there's uh, other ways that they try to manipulate the markets because what always happens with uh, like any type of currency uh, throughout time, like a fiat currency, it, it lives and it dies with the empire or the government that controls it. Uh, but at the end, the back side of it, you actually see financialization and that is what, uh, what happens. You see just the like, financialization, so you have all these uh, things that you can do with your money to make money so you don't need to do anything else. You don't need to produce a good product or you don't need to go to Mars or, or travel. You don't really uh, become uh, expansive human beings like exploring this universe and, and things like that. We just stick there and, and then uh, play with money, making money and then there's no innovation, there's no creation of value uh, anymore. It really slows down. And uh, what you see now, what you know, the closure of, of all these stores in, uh, in North America, there's, of course, like has something to do with uh, the e-commerce platforms like yeah, Amazon and everything. What it, re it really also has to do, with, we're kind of getting that point where it's called the peak debt point, that I call it here, here at peak credit, where there's nobody else to lend you. And when it comes to credit, uh, your viewers are probably familiar with it, but when you go and borrow from a bank, you actually borrow the money, which comes out of nowhere, uh, out of nothing. But then on top of that, they charge you an interest rate, and that interest rate doesn't exist. Uh, so how are you going to pay on that interest? Well, you're going to keep on adding more debt into the system. To then, but then you get, it's like an ever-ending uh, hockey stick uh, at one point. And you can, if you pull the, up far enough, you'll see the hockey stick right now. Uh, if you look at M3 money supply or... Which they stopped publishing the data conveniently a few years ago. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. They removed the M3, of course, because that's a whole broad, like that's all the money that's created. And now it's just like a more narrower supply of money. So it looks like it's better than it is. But you could just go to the shadow side with John Williams. He's, he's great. He's still publishing that out and making people aware of it. But then, of course, you have all this other money that has been talked about. Mike 
get more, you know, found, uh, you know, transactions in the what was it, Department of Justice, uh, no defense, and other or something. I think it's Department of Injustice. Department of Injustice, Injustice of course, yeah. Uh, and they found, you know, twenty-one trillion dollars of like transaction that they couldn't really come. From. It's like, what's going on here? Like, where, where's, where's that money going? Where's it coming from? He tried to really go in and then talk to them and try to find answers, but then. Uh, sometimes you'll get like sheets of paper, like huge stacks of paper, which is like, blacked out with papers. Yeah, I mean, there's probably about 50 different things that you just brought up that we could uh, get into. And I can't remember the guy's name, but there was, I, actually, you know, it just came to me. Mark Pittman, I think, was the guy who ended up suing. He did a FOIA request, uh, I think it was maybe 2009, 2010. And what they uh, found out was that there was a like a secret bailout, and that the real bailout wasn't the TARP 800 billion. That it was really the 16, or roughly. Some people say it was 10 trillion. Some people say it was 16. Okay, but there was 10 or 16, very big number. And essentially, that went to the richest people in the world. It went to, uh, I mean, like it went to like Gaddafi's bank actually. And then you know he wasn't playing ball anymore, so they and he wanted to help build up his people. So then they had to go and uh, you know do away with him. And then you also had like the Bank of England was a major recipient of it. So it's almost like this Rob Peter to pay Paul game where we're just passing around this hot potato of, okay, now it's your turn to bail it out. It's your turn to bail it out. And, uh, and you brought up the debt and we just recently we hit $22 trillion. And a lot of conservatives right now are under the impression that Trump is actually doing a lot of really great things to lower uh, the debt and deficit. We've seen the deficit go from about $666 billion with Obama, a very big number. And uh, this year, I mean, it could very easily, it's probably going to be over a trillion dollars. It was over a trillion last year if you count uh, the actual, how much the debt actually went up. Yeah, and unfunded liabilities, all that. Like, I think we're going to just keep on going that debt. Deficit is going to increase to one trillion, two trillion, three trillion, five trillion, ten trillion. Who knows where it's going to go? Because what's going to happen is there's so many unfunded liabilities that the government has promised people uh, uh, that you know you're going to get this money uh, and we're going to provide it to you, but they don't have it in tax income, so they got to go and just borrow that money out of thin air, and, and that's just going to continue. But this is just a continuous cycle where it's just going to get faster and faster, and uh, you're going to see high, like. The number is probably like the deficit or the debt is going to double again, you know, like it did under Obama. We're going to see another doubling in uh, eight or so years. We're going to have 40 trillion, we're going to have 80 trillion. Yeah, we, we are on pace right now that if Trump were to win uh, again, not that I'm saying I want to or not, but if, if he does in another, uh, I guess in 2020, he will be on pace to have doubled the debt or to at least have added just as much debt as Obama. And I think a lot of people are completely oblivious to that. And so, we're in a situation where we need to keep basically doubling the debt every eight years just to keep things, you know, working again. Well, it's, yeah, it, it, it's a kinky system, Tim, and, and uh, how they do it, they just got to keep on, you know, printing as much money as possible to keep their system afloat. Everybody has to be indebted. If not everybody's indebted, but what, what are you going to do when you can keep debt, as I said, when there's nobody else to borrow and more money to that You can have that debt collapse, you can have a deflation, and that's the major enemy of any uh, of these uh, these guys, it's, uh, it's the deflation because uh, who was it? It was Ben Bernanke saying in 2002 in his inaugural speech when he became governor, he said uh, that you know we're going to look at probably buying a lot more assets, but he also said that uh, deflation is the moral enemy and the only way to do it. But inflation, the printing presses will always win. That's what he said. So we basically is going to fight deflation, which is more money printing, uh, which of course is going to end up. If, Take a look at history, like the, the French Revolution, all these uh, uh, different hyperinflations. You know, just during the 1900s, you had about uh, 50 hyperinflations of currencies that failed. Uh, same kind of concept. Just now we are in newer, more electronic age, so they can. That's why they're getting away with it better this time. But the problem is, at one point, you're gonna have the Gilles Jean, like you have in, in France, coming out, and people are not gonna be able to afford food. Uh, just the regular things in their lives to uh, be able to survive, and that's where you're going to have the revolution coming in. Uh, and, it, and, and it's coming, you see, like the, the uh, middle class is getting eradicated. Uh, you have this, uh, like, more of a rich and poor starting to, you know, happening. And, and, and that always happens with money printing. You know, the more money you print, uh, the bigger divide you're going to have in the gap. Uh, so if you have stable money, it's, it's not going to happen. But I, I'm, I know we wanted to talk about what, you know, what is, like, happening with the stock market and everything why, why is uh, it's always moving up what is uh, you know you were talking about how the central banks kind of work together I recently I'm doing a report right now on central banks the major central banks and I found uh, some interesting facts so 
Uh, of course, the uh, the Federal Reserve has you know the, got rid of about six percent last year in 2018. Got rid of six percent of their balance sheet. Uh, meanwhile, it was uh, the Bank of England, it was uh, ECB, and the Bank of Japan has loaded up. I think their balance sheets are off about ten uh, percent. So, so that was that hot potato that we were talking about. Yeah, as exactly, soon as the yeah, Federal Reserve stopped. It around. Yeah, exactly. When you have the easing at the Federal Reserve, uh, the, they're trying to sell it off their money. And then, you know, they're just passing the block. Like, hey, you go and print money. Uh, and that's that's a great thing with this one. Now it's global. So then all of them are kind of really merged into this one system where everybody's just helping each other out. Uh, when you have a problem over here, you just look at, oh yeah, look at the United States. Even the United States, oh, they're printing a lot of money because you gotta remember you have a deficit of 860 something now, a uh, billion, well, uh, tenfold that. Like, if, if it was like a trillion, for example, you could have 10 trillion more in currency in the commercial banking system, and that money gets deposited into those commercial banks eventually. So, uh, they're still printing so much money that even though they're saying that they're easing the, uh, the economy, but uh, when it comes to, we were talking about all the central banks, and it's kind of like, uh, I, 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 it's not a conspiracy, uh, because you can go and look at something called the Exchange Stabilization Fund that's out there. The Exchange Stabilization was, uh, Fund was you know, created in 2000, uh, no, in, uh, in 1933, during the gold act, where they actually confiscated the gold from the public, and then they put the $2 billion into the Exchange Stabilization Fund, and, um, and, and, who, and who runs the exchange stabilization funds? It's supposed to be the treasury, so that's that's where you found it. Uh, so it's essentially the treasury, and what it is, it's basically trying to stabilize the US dollar. So if something happens, and this was like, I, I, I have a couple of books that I looked through, um, and what it shows, it shows all the interventions that they had. And, you know, since the 30s, they have you know, about 80 interventions where they basically go out and put credit lines out to different countries. Like they, actually, currently, they have a constant three billion dollar credit line uh, to the Mexican government if they have any problems with their uh, their Mexican peso. So the, the, and then when they can't pay that back and they lend them more and it's just yeah, to exactly. keep it because ultimately if you want to keep everybody in debt it means you want to keep everybody enslaved because I mean the root word of, is of you know a bond is you know you're in bondage and so they're just this perpetual slavery that we're at. So we're going to continue with the exchange stabilization fund because this is something that I'm not as familiar with and you're just obviously a sort of wealth of information on the yeah, no, I, I bumped into it uh, through a video that probably most other people that know about it uh, bumped into. It was Eric de Carbonell. Uh, he, he, I think his family was bankers, and he, I, I guess, he learned about this exchange stabilization and so on. So he did a video connecting it, fantastic video connecting it to the CIA and what was going on, you know, the coups and so around the world. And so I, I wanted to dig a little bit more. So I found some very interesting books that showed the actual whole structure of the exchange stabilization fund, how they have trading desks in all these different countries around the world. This was the 60s, so I can't exactly say that that's what they have today, but at that time they were able to go and trade gold, like go and manipulate the gold price if they wanted to, any pro like any assets that they could go into in order, it's the, kind of like the plunge protection team that we hear about today, and I think it's a part of it. Uh, because they could just go out and put out a whole bunch of money from their fund, like currently they have 92 uh, billion dollars around the world like in any currencies for example they're very afraid of any currency going bust because if that happens well a lot of people are going to look at the dollar uh, and it's like it's the dollar you know going to collapse next uh, because people are starting to get educated about this deep currency system and you see that like more and more people around the world are now doing cross currency swaps so they're getting out of the US dollar and that's uh, like the whole thing with this exchange stabilization fund is to make it stable. Actually, the England has it as well. They call it the exchange stabilization fund. Um, but this is what's all about. It's all about stabilizing the currency and controlling you know, the stability. Because all, uh, all about that, if, if the currency is not stable, uh, it's stable in uh, you know their eyes, not not in our eyes. It's constantly losing value. But uh, if it's not that, you know, there the, could the be people actually seeing that. We're not going to accept this uh, garbage fiat currency anymore, and then they're going to uh, stop using it. And that is their worst nightmare because over time, like a, a lot of the fiat currencies I studied, it's the time, and, and this happened in Venezuela just recently, it's the time when they actually, the populace say, like, I'm not going to have this worthless uh, toilet paper anymore. 
I'm gonna use gold or cryptocurrency, anything that you know has value that they could trade with each other. Actually, the toilet paper becomes worth more than the actual actually, money because oh, yeah. you, you can actually use the toilet paper for something. And uh, you're gonna actually make it to the point where you know Casio Cortez better stop you know hating all the billionaires because they're gonna make everyone a billionaire at the rate that they're going. Uh, and that's, I think I saw Maduro came out and tried to say, oh, we got all these evil speculators or all these, you know, get price gougers who are raising the price on all their goods. And, we're gonna, and they're basically domestic terrorists and we need to come in and basically stop that. But, you know, if you're going to stop people from bringing in new goods. Yeah, we could just send nice bread lines. That, that works pretty, pretty fine for any country, doesn't it? You know, it's, I, I just, like, Venezuela has been like a case that I saw back in 2015 because we're so dependent on oil. Like, when oil was 130, that's what they based their uh, budget on. And then, of course, it fell. They had to print uh, all the money to cover their massive government. They don't have a lot of taxes in Venezuela, but they just use, the, you know, the oil royalties. And you see this in Canada. We have a, a, a two provinces that's just struggling massively now because the oil prices and uh, the in Labrador and Alberta, all the countries actually, even Norway was struggling. They started using, going into deficits in their budget for the first time ever now because of the oil price, the dependency on an asset and the government stealing that asset from the population uh, through, through you know, the, uh, getting the royalties and everything. Instead of actually giving that money back to the population, they, it's just the government siphoning off that money from their, their corporate friends instead of growing capital. Yeah, so one thing I hope you guys can see here is I wanted to get a good cross section of people who are actually at this conference because you hear, uh, you know, Anarch Poco and you're thinking, you know, it's you know guys in black black masks throwing Molotov cocktails through. But can you watch. Give, there's a lot of bullets flying around there. <laughs> but can you can you give us, you know, maybe, uh, you know, kind of your take on the conference and who, you know, the types of people that are here and are you know are these conversations and is this something that's you know one off or is you know. Or, or do you think that you know everyone here is sort of on this level in terms of you know their knowledge base and what they believe in, and just kind of give it an overall, uh, I guess, opinion on the type of people in here and the conference. You know, it, it, it's a, it's a diverse crowd. We got everything from the hippies to the libertarians, uh, but we're all freedom-loving people. And I, I don't know how many fantastic people like from hippies, everybody that just have this one thing that they want to do. We don't want you know this massive government control over ourselves. We want to be individuals and and have self-control and ownership over ourselves. And, and the, the human beings here, this is definitely not a one-off. This is just one of many, many beautiful conversations and philosophical conversations that we had here. Uh, meeting, you know, I don't know how many friends I've like, I was there last year, and I probably had 20 friends that I met that I could truly call like friends for life that I have now. Like, I, I, you know, men deep, you know, meaningful relationship here because we, we want to change the world in a positive uh, manner and, and that's where you, you, like this is the networking event you know we can have like here uh, in beautiful like a local mexico where it's really nice and hot you know for people that like to go on a vacation especially for me coming from minus 30 up in uh, Canada. Ernie and I had to escape Phoenix, Arizona, so you know, it's, you always want to escape Phoenix in February, but it, this must be great for you. What was like negative 50 out of uh, Yeah, it's the worst. Yeah, yeah. They had about 50 something with the windshield, so it was, it was uh, pretty cold. Pretty cold, yeah. And, uh, but it's just beautiful down there. Like, look at all the uh, people uh, out there. You know, we're, we're trying to uh, push the world into the world into a better place and, and uh, kind of forward humanity so we can educate people, yeah. we can yeah. really make the world a better place because this, that's what it's all about, that's what these, all these conversations are all about. And, uh, the guys like you and me, you know, we're, we're starting to like slowly become really good friends because we, we have that true meaning, true, true deep uh, want to actually uh, change the world to, to that place that we really want to see and, and help others and educate others to actually uh, make that the next leap, to, you know, we don't need a government anymore, we, we need to be independent, you know, let's get rid of all the banksters uh, that's out there, the, 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 the controllers, you know, uh, uh, Jamie Dimon over there at JP Morgan and his JP Morgan coin that's coming out, uh, uh, you could call it a shit coin, sorry, uh, you might have to censor me, <laughs> oh, dude, that out, but uh, that's, that's uh, you know, what these banksters are trying to do, they're just trying to go off to, you know, the actual moon, because this is what it is. Like crypto and everything else that we're doing, we, de we are decentralizing away from the central control uh, of uh, this elite that you know, has been strangling us for years and everybody is just feeling that they're, you know, gasping for air. And now we're actually giving, you know, we're, we're kind of like trying to, uh, we're finding that somebody is strangling us and we're trying to like, just help that guy, you know, get the hands off of him from the government. 
And, uh, and the average person is just trying to get more and more rope to further and uh, basically enslave everyone else. But we actually, I think we're going to cut it here. I just yep. wanted to get a good cross-section of the people that are here. And uh, thank you very much. This is actually our first time ever meeting in person. Yeah, very, very much a pleasure. It's been wonderful. Thank you, John. Thank you for listening to the show. One of the ways you can help support the show is by seeing if it makes sense to invest with myself. I'm a certified financial planner with Innovative Advisory Group, LLC. Innovative specializes in self-directed IRAs where you can invest into virtually anything, including virtual assets and cryptocurrencies inside your retirement accounts. And get this, you can actually hold on to the private key. And that's something that nobody else is doing, at least with the help of an advisor. We also run protective growth portfolios where you invest a small amount of your portfolio into put options and while the rest, and that basically helps protect the rest of the portfolio. Not very many people are familiar with put options, but a lot of people are familiar with homeowners insurance and it works in a very similar fashion. So essentially what you're doing is using a very, very small percentage of uh, basically you know the value of the home to protect the rest of the home. And if the house doesn't burn down or there isn't a major catastrophe, then you're basically out on the, the uh, cost of the insurance. Flip side, on, uh, you know, if your house ends up burning down, well then you build your house back. And that's really the same thing that's going on here. So if the market ends up tanking, and we know the most that you, that you can possibly lose on your investment, and honestly, if the market were to go down 60, 70%, uh, and you're only down single digits potentially, then that's an amazing buying opportunity. Lord Nathan Rothschild said it best that the best time to invest is when there's blood in the streets. But if your money goes down with everybody else's, then you're not able to take advantage of the next crisis. And also, if you're just camping out in cash or in bonds, making next to nothing, you could be going broke safely for a very long time. And then you've got to know when to time the market. And that's something that basically nobody can do. Uh, now on the flip side, if I'm wrong in all this and the market keeps going higher or the Federal Reserve comes out or the European Central Bank comes out and says, hey, we're going to print a whole bunch more money and the market goes to infinity, well then you'll go up to infinity minus the cost of that put option. So I think that this is a great strategy that you definitely want to learn more about. I mean, just given the craziness that's going on right now, uh, I mean, if you're heavy into cash right now, heavy into bonds or even heavy into stocks, especially if you're close to actually needing those funds for retirement or just needing those funds in general, maybe for a big project or maybe you work on a crypto and you raised a whole bunch of money, that this is something that we can help protect yourself and protect your loved ones. And there's really, there's nothing you have to lose by scheduling a free consultation with us. And actually there's a chance you could lose a lot by not talking with us in general. If you go and click on our website in the upper right hand corner, there's a work with Tim button up there. You can see all of our plans, ways we work with our clients, pricing can all be found there. And given that I'm sort of out there on a lot of different political issues, I know that I'm not gonna be for everybody. You know, that's uh, sort of my way of uh, qualifying you, not the other way around, but you know, I'm fine. I'm not trying to have all six, pe six billion people out there like me. And I'm um, here to really at the end of the day to tell the truth and to make money, not necessarily make friends. So head over to thelibertyadvisor.com and let's see what we can do for you. Thank you.